but use of brown water to grow in large extent of field crops is a story of the last, last 50 or 60 years. And this story has emerged primarily uh, because uh, of the way in which uh, energy supply policies to ground water has been over the country. Uh, during 1935 to 60, when both the tubal technology as well as mechanized pumps became available, the governments of northern states tried very hard to get farmers to use ground water. It's a on your farm, and you can make this tubal yearly to make it to do one of the things. And the farmers throughout Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, just, they just didn't accept mm -hmm. pumping, you know, loot, lifting groundwater to use uh, to mature crops for the good idea. It was only until the 1960s when our food situation became, you know, very, very precarious that the government started pushing both green revolution seeds as well as the tubal technology. And then to the district magistrates were given quotas that every month you must electrify at least 150 tubal, otherwise there's a transfer. So there was a push uh, on the district collectors, district magistrates to actually popularize and push the electric uh, tubal to make it simple. The government started giving all kinds of subsidies, okay, the cable is wrong for your farm, nothing will be charged to you, all of it will come free. So the seeds of subsidy or electricity to farm was sown around the 1960s at the time the Green Revolution was happening. Many people think that the Green Revolution was about, was about uh, seed fertilizer technology. But few people realize, realize that the tubal revolution in, that started in Punjab, went to Haryana, came to Western UP, that actually was an important part of uh, the Green Revolution. So actually, the politicians had already figured out, figured out by 1970s that promoting tubal irrigation is an essential part of a and green revolution in their state. The reason why Eastern UK and Bihar didn't have green revolution <coughs> until well into 1970s was because they didn't have uh, tubal technology. And even today, Bihar has very, a very low density of uh, anodized uh, tubulars compared to the Western UK. So electricity subsidy on winter supply, power supply was used as a trigger to spread green revolution and agriculture development throughout in your budget However, as the number of tubers increased, the state governments and electricity boards were faced with the huge and soaring cost, transaction costs of metering, reading meters, billing farmers according to meter, uh, meter power consumption. And the, the electricity board started in Uttar Pradesh, unionized, and they started subcontracting uh, meter reading work to uh, So there was a complete mess in reading meters. So some states in the 1980s say, okay, why? And actually there was a Reserve Bank of India committee which uh, found that the cost of meter supply, cost of metering power supply to farmers is a significant part. I don't remember what proportion was that, but 30-40% of the total cost of supply. So some states decided, actually began, began around 1980, state after state began changing from meter power supply to farmers to a flat tariff. They tell farmers, okay, you use power uh, and you will be charged based on the number of horsepower, the size of your farm. If you have a 5 horsepower farm, then you pay 1,000 rupees. If you have a 15 horsepower farm, you pay 3,000 rupees. Now, this system of abolishing meters actually was made, gave a major, uh, major uh, stimulus to ground water. Actually, throughout uh, the, the country, Downwater markets, irrigation service markets emerged because this change from meter tariff to flat tariff changed the incentives of tuber owners. <coughs> the tuber owners found that at the end of, end of the month you have to pay 1500 rupees anyway. So instead of using water on the own field, you also supply water to the neighboring farm. So this created huge water markets throughout, uh, throughout India. It also led to major groundwater development. I wrote articles in the 1980s eulogizing this water market because. In several of my studies, I found that uh, very small farmers and marginal farmers who would never get their own tubers. They were now getting quality irrigation service from farmers who had their own tubers and were under flat tariff. So in Gujarat, which until 1980, 1988 was charging meter tariff, the small farmers had to pay a very high price for the water that they got. So I uh, we argued with the state government that look, in UP, elsewhere, farmers are getting water so cheap, and in Gujarat, farmers had to pay so high. Eventually, Gujarat also tumbled and adopted, adopted that type. But this was a watershed. 
So as the state electricity board started charging to but when you have to pump water from 100 feet, 150 feet, 200 feet, 250 feet, number one, you could use a diesel pump, even if you are willing to pay for diesel. Because diesel pump would just not work. And second, if you use electric pump, and if you charge three and a half rupees per unit, then you'll be bankrupt. So this got farmers in the country to organize it throughout the Western Corridor, to organize into work banks. This is a single point demand. Keep the power plant power very stationary. So for the past 20 years, what we have seen are political battles, electoral battles, <coughs> you know, fought and won and lost, essentially on this single point, uh, point of agenda. So we had Rakshik Kaliti, who actually, when he, before he came to power, he promised not only free power, but free power up to 2017. <laughs> so power supply, free power supply to agriculture, power subsidy to agriculture has become, has become an integral part of the country's electoral uh, politics. So who could ground water irrigation farmers organize into a great work bank and basically the one point agenda was, uh, was, is, was to preserve the big plan. Now today if we wanted to, if for example we just did a thought experiment and if we, let's say that tomorrow morning there is no subsidy on farm power supply, that every farmer has to pay on meter rate, there may can be some subsidy on the meter rate but nobody will get uh, power without then actually in the next few five years, my surmise is that we would see major changes. I think that the groundwater situation in the majority of the western states would dramatically improve if we three or four good monsoons. Number two, I, in my opinion, the area under irrigation would probably drop overnight by 25 to 30 million hectares. I think areas like North Gujarat and many parts of Maharashtra, Karnataka would just go out of cultivation or go back to the area. The, so it's such a move, such a move overnight would be immiserizing in, in ways that you cannot imagine. So I do not think that to argue that power subsidies would be removed in any time soon is a realistic, uh, realistic uh, position. What we have in South Asia today are there are four different broad categories of groundwater use in agriculture region. The ideal, in my opinion, is what we have in Kerala and dry areas of Sri Lanka, or dry zones of Sri Lanka. Now here, these are our hard rock aquifer areas. The power subsidy is here at zero. Actually, the farmers have to pay a negative power subsidy because beyond a certain limit, 90 or 100 units per household, they have to start paying a premium price because they all use the personal domestic connection, power connection, for uh, irrigating garden agriculture. The groundwater structures are basically shallow, very shallow open wells. Uh, with, a, with a wide, they're actually storage wells. So they have a diameter of five or six, four or five or six meters, they're huge kind of wells. The type of agriculture is garden agriculture, very high value crop. I mean, Kerala is mostly spicy and so forth. In northern no, no, Sri Lanka, it's, uh, it's vegetable. The net income per hectare is $3,000 to $6,000 per hectare, which is kind of Spanish uh, kind of uh, agricultural income. And groundwater externality, as far as I could see, there is hardly, hardly any no groundwater for it. The second major category that we have is Eastern India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, India, and Sin. Uh, these are all alluvial areas, alluvial aquifer areas. Large parts of these are very humid. All of Eastern India and Bangladesh are very humid. There is no subsidy. There is also very little power available to, to farmers. And therefore, there is some amount of uh, shallow uh, tube well groundwater irrigation and a little bit diesel pumps. And as diesel prices have been soaring, agriculture here is getting squeezed. So in West Bengal, we are, you find that uh, in West Bengal, the, the biggest example is the boro rice has been going down year by year after year. Pre summer rice, which is the main crop of West Bengal in Bangladesh, has been shrinking because it's irrigation intensive and farmers just cannot afford diesel. Here the income per hectare is $500,000. Uh, you have arsenic is a major problem, but I haven't seen major any association of arsenic contamination with, uh, with groundwater irrigation. The third category that we have are Indian Punjab, Haryana, West Rajasthan, alluvial Gujarat, arid, you know, and these are arid alluvial parts of Western India, part of a Western corridor. The power subsidy is very high. It's 15,000 rupees to 45, 50,000 rupees per hectare. 
and you let these reports are getting bankrupt just because of uh, this power substitution. Tube is a very deep in Gujarat, the tube will go up to for the depth of 30 and 300 feet. The horse power of pumps is 10 to 120 horsepower uh, elevated pumps. Now this power and very precious fossil ground water is used primarily to do basin beta rise. The things that Indian farmers never did, uh, you know, before. So this is the most wasteful kind of energy agriculture <laughs> like the root regime. The income is very low, eight hundred to thousand dollars, and the externalities are humongous. There is groundwater depletion. There is right uh, concentration in groundwater. This kind of depends uh, more or less directly on the date from which groundwater is pumped, and there are other geogenic contaminants, contaminants from the different people. And the fourth category is Hard Rock Peninsula India, which is the lower part of the Western Corridor. Again, power subsidy is significant, five rupees to thirty, five thousand to thirty thousand rupees per hectare. That come bore wells, or now bore wells in with deep tube wells with 5 to 12 horsepower electric pumps are the rule. Crops, mostly grains and bitty cotton. Some amount of value farming, that is farming of uh, garden crops for market. Uh, income, again, no big deal. And externality, a huge name. So the main problem areas are category 3 and category 4 areas. The shark name. Yeah. So basically over, over the past 50 years, what we've seen is that, uh, is that all these earlier means of irrigation that we had developed, pull-up whalers, public tubers, denial irrigation tanks, all of them have lost out to electric tubers in the waste ecology. And that is primarily because of the power systems. And this shows that uh, the areas which have very high proportion of electric tubers, they are also the areas which have so before we can crack this energy irrigation nexus, I think the essential thing is to bring back uh, the groundwater regime from the left to the right. The post monsoon, the water tables rise to pre-development level. And some work that has been done in Gujarat actually, by the government, mostly the government initially, but also with collaboration of large number of NGOs, where there has been more demand side as well as supply side <coughs> initiatives. That is one kind of example of, uh, of what as you may one of the world's largest surface irrigation infrastructure, the U.S. is the biggest groundwater champion. Power subsidy is designed to stimulate well irrigation. Today, I've turned to feeding agricultural economy, which is precariously dependent on groundwater irrigation. Increasing pumping depth made power subsidy is essential for protecting agrarian livelihoods. And hence, it's energy water livelihoods nexus rather than energy water food nexus. Uh, laws to protect drinking water sources. And I think that's important. That Maharashtra is one state which has tried to protect drinking water wells mm -hmm. from uh, irrigation wells through a formal law enacted in 1996. And in, 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 in the program, we had two three studies commissioned just to examine the effectiveness of this law. And almost all of them found that there was tremendous resistance to the uh, in, to invoking this law, even among the people who were affected. By this, because you have to file a, a, a complaint with a panchayat, and no panchayat uh, was, was willing to do this law. So there was not a single uh, case of a, uh, a case brought to the courts in which a, an irrigation well was kind of being denied. Abolishing power subsidies completely will have huge political and livelihoods costs, but restore, will restore aquifers over several years. And therefore, a more, more practical approach has to be, has, has to be tried. And, and I kind of think that uh, what Gujarat has done is, uh, what Gujarat has done is that, especially in some parts, it is kind of over the past 20 years, uh, religious gurus, NGOs, government have come together to do water harvesting and decentralized recharge on a massive scale in terms of hundreds of thousands of structures, um, which were first constructed by people and then maintained by them. Uh, and this in hard rock areas with a limited storage ability. They seem to have kind of changed the groundwater regime mm -hmm. in ways uh, that are happening. The second thing that Gujarat has done is that it has actually rewired the countryside. It has spent about 1300 crores in separating agricultural connections from all rural and other rural connections. And then they have imposed a power ration. Now, this is kind of the second best way of uh, putting a cap on the amount of groundwater that every farmer, as well as all farmers together, can, can draw. It is also kind of given the government a switch 
you know, in the year of drought when the water tables are depleting, you can actually impose certain discipline on farmers by reducing the power quota, uh, you know, or the other way. So there is a certain kind of leverage that the government has now got on bringing under control these very unwieldy and anarchic uh, groundwater farm. <coughs> now if you look at Biscom, Biscom, it's trying to do the same thing through Grand Jyoti. It is kind of separating. But Biscom is still only a thousand illegal connections. And the Biscom officials just aren't, don't have the courage to go to the villages, which have these concentrations of illegal connections. So I think that before the Gujarat idea begins to work uh, elsewhere, um, there is separating between us. This basic governance issues have to be first, first tackled, otherwise it just uh, doesn't work. 